series, training series on uh, the open air uh, graph for centimetric research. In this venture, I'm uh, teaming up with uh, Alison from uh, Campinas University in Brazil. So it's really early morning for him. Cheer, cheers for that. Cheers for that. Kudos. And um, so he, he, is, he, is, he is way more um, proficient in Google uh, Cloud technologies than I am. I'm picking up fast, but uh, he has been my counselor uh so far uh because he has been working for a project of the of uh, of his own uh mostly with the uh, with uh google and uh google bigquery so in these training today is four hours in total and um you are going to have a, a, a brief introduction on google cloud and bigquery uh, there will be an introduction and, and recap on on what is open air open air graph and why we think that uh moving towards bigquery is is uh, is a must do then it will follow a gentle introduction on sql and uh this is why i mean we try not to be too technical from the start yet, so uh proficiency with sql is not wasn't a hard requirement uh and um wait um receiving messages um so it's not a hard requirement for for this training but and and this is why we want to go on on a, on a brief overview of that then there's a uh a needed break and after the break it will be uh two hours or so on 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 uh, hands-on uh, exercises on, on BigQuery. So before the break, don't don't panic. You will not be requested to access um, Google Cloud and uh, we can sort it out uh, later during the break or just at the beginning of the, after the break when we, when we reprise. So objective of this training, it's of course like trying to, uh, to kick the tie with uh, open air graph and familiarize with SQL and BigQuery. And we will go through in, 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 uh, in, uh, in runs of, of progressively more complex queries to try in, in with the objective of gaining proficiency in, in, in formulating questions and getting results to, uh, to our data set. So uh, housekeeping rules, uh, silence the mic, raise your hands if you wanna talk anytime. I uh, encourage you uh, to, it's not, to be, it's not intended to be a frontal lesson. So uh, feel free to interrupt if you feel so. And um, turn on the camera if you like when you, when you uh, are talking. And then, so uh, we changed the format many times and, uh, but so we are not going to split in parallel sessions, uh, but we are thinking to use breakout rooms for troubleshooting. So whenever um, someone encounters something that, uh, it, this, I mean, the, the, the problem can be prompted uh to everybody but then if if we see that it goes probably to a uh, direction that takes too much to be solved or it, that is not um beneficial for everybody then we have the chances to move at least either me or Alison or Miriam that's uh that's uh following today together with me we can move to we can jump to um a room and break out the room and 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 chase the problem directly okay uh now alison back to you okay uh, you will pass the slide so so we will start talking about <clears throat> google bigquery google is one of the tools in the context of google cloud platform it's a set of commercial tools for what we call today cloud computing which is what like i like to say is leasing computing power from from a company something else and they have all kinds of regular services, such as hosting websites, hosting mobile applications, dedicated virtual machines, databases. They have also tools for special applications, such as a speech to text conversion, image description conversion. Now it's very fashionable to have all these AI tools as well within the framework of Google Cloud Platform. 
and you have uh, this form of uh, Jupyter Notebook, if you are familiar with using Jupyter Notebooks uh, with Python or with R uh, as installers in your computer. Maybe you know that Google also has uh, a version of this with all the Anaconda distribution installed, which is Python plus all its uh, data science tools uh, in, in, a, uh, in an online cloud tool called Google Collaboratory. So much the same way as you have Google Docs, Google Spreadsheets, you have Google Collaboratory. And one of the, the main tool, I think, uh, for us and for most uh, medium to, to small size companies is, is this uh, data warehouses, managed data warehouse called Google BigQuery. And they have different pricing schemes for all these tools. It's very confusing in practice. But uh, the final line is it's mostly cheap. I mean, it's the cheapest thing that you can get in for a short term, middle term project. Because otherwise, if you buy machinery to have your own SQL server, to have your own data, that will cost you several years of, of a budget in, in, in a tool, in a cloud tool such as that. There are competitors, not very, not many. Uh, I think most of there is one real competitor. There's Alibaba Max Compute. Maybe someday we will we'll have a training on Alibaba Max Compute. I don't know. There is also uh, Amazon Redshift, but... Mostly Amazon Redshift is, uh, their pricing scheme is mostly for large companies, <clears throat> even though it's very similar to Google Cloud. <laughs> I mean, they are uh, they are more expensive than Google, than Google BigQuery, but they only get cheaper at very large scales of user data. So Google Cloud is usually used on the web browser, like you are going to use here. Even large companies use it that way on a web interface, so they install anything. But it can be used also programmatically through an SDK. So you can really write, uh, use something like an API to write queries and automatically uh, dispatch queries, etc. But it's most of the time you'll be using the web browser. You can uh, skip. If you prefer, I can share the screen as well. So how uh, how does it work? It's a data warehouse in this based on um, SQL or SQL, if you prefer. So you have several tools to stream data in and out. We as a researcher in bibliometrics and cytometrics, usually we don't stream data in and out. We upload and download in batches and, and files in different file formats. But there are tools to automatically stream data in and out as is usual in data companies because they have websites and, and forms and, and mobile applications all inputting data. It has direct access to cloud storage, uh, Google Cloud Storage. If you store large things on Google Cloud, you can, if they are in formats that allow for tabular uh, expansion, you can upload them straight into Google BigQuery. And you, you have very low maintenance costs. You are charged, charged really by the queries, by the amount of query. It's very hard. As I told you, it's very confusing to know the price, but our estimation is uh, that we that the first terabyte is for free, and then every terabyte of queries is about $6. If I'm not mistaking my last numbers. So it's very easy to collaborate and share data sets. So if you create data set, you can share to another person, another group of people. You can share to the whole internet, like we did here <coughs> with some uh, some of our data sets. I show you. Uh, and you can also have access to public data sets as well that are shared by companies or by Google themselves move on so uh i think it's you you can as i was mentioning you have very few direct competitors it's based on those already known large-scale computing technologies it's, uh, it's an sql uh managed service built on top of uh, kubernetes and then on top of hadoop etc but this is very technical and you can query even petabytes with Google BigQuery. And uh, in, in a very short term, you will see it's, if you are used to SQL servers using of any brand, you will see it's very similar as it's shown here on the screen, the way it's organizing, but it's much more powerful than any server that you could possibly buy. Uh, so uh, you, you can go back. Let me talk a little bit, please, sorry. Then you have, you see the screen is mostly like that. At your left, you have this, uh, the set of all data sets to which you have access and also to the files for the queries if they are stored. You have here in the middle an area where you have 
you can check the details for every table or for every data set. Here you are seeing the table publications inside the data set OAG 2407, which is open, open air graph uh, 24-7. And you can see the field names and the types. Also, this is the area where you have the query uh, editor. Uh, next. next one. And then you can do all these basic tasks. We will show you how to import and export data. It's just upload and download file for us, for our... You can create copy data sets and tables very easily, just with SQL uh, command line or else using the web interface. It's very common <clears throat> that you also, uh, to organize your things, you can use Google Colab that I was mentioning, where you can query things on Python and on R straight into BigQuery. You don't have to download it or, or upload anything. You just run a specific uh, set of SQL code inside Colab. You, you, are, you can be querying straight into BigQuery without using any virtual machine, intermediate virtual machine or, or of any sort. Next one. So this is the window for the query. You, you type in a query here. In it, This is not exactly uh, ANSI standard SQL. Why? Because standard SQL does not account for all the possibilities that large-scale uh, data warehousing uh, uh, congregate. So they have more things than the, the standard SQL. In the beginning, in 2016, 2017, Google was using their version. It's called, it was called Google SQL. But they are progressively abandoning this. Now they are moving to something that's more ANSI compatible. It's more standardized. But still you have functions and specific differences because of the large scale uh, environment, right? And move the next one. So you have this possibility of having collab, of course, but you also now have this, this is a very new thing from, from the last few months that you can have the collab notebook here inside the Google BigQuery interface, you can see you create, like in any Jupyter notebook, a cell with code, which can be Python code, and mixed with SQL, just using this uh, uh, percent percent sign BigQuery. Then you will, just below it, you can type in any SQL statement that will output something. If you want the output to be a local Pandas data frame, you just type in the name. Here it says results. This is the variable name to which I will um, input the result for this query. Otherwise, I can just write SQL queries that will create and change tables without outputting the table to the local notebook and to the local uh, Python environment. But this makes life much easier if you are combining database systems and Python processing. I only want to, to tell a cautionary tale. Anything that you do on SQL will be faster, will be more efficient no matter how, what. You, you move outside SQL and outside BigQuery when you really cannot do something within it because it's automatically parallel, right? It's a tabular uh, database environment. Next one. And then this is an example of a notebook being built. I have a cell showing the first 20 publications in table publications, and then a cell where I am filtering for publications uh, from year 2020 on, I mean, 2020 plus. So just information about the price, I was mentioning the price. If you want to test this yourself outside the context of this training, you can use the public data sets uh, there. are. Well, you, you will see a few. Um, but for every Google account, the first time you open the Google Cloud Platform, you have this $300 uh, dollars credit that you can activate it by credit, putting your credit card, it's not charged. Uh, and, and the trial period is about three months. Like uh, It's very similar to, to the other providers like uh, Microsoft and Amazon and even Alibaba. They have similar similar ideas. Sometimes the credit, it's longer uh, lasting, shorter lasting. But, but this 300, I, I insist that since this is cheap and it costs a few dollars every terabyte, this 300 credits you, usually is enough for you to make a PhD, right? It's... So it will amount for several, several, several queries. And um, well, here we have more precise numbers. You see the first terabyte is uh, for free if you're already paying and roughly $6, $6.25 every terabyte. And then you can go there to activate the free tire. You don't have to do this now because we are adding you to the system. So your, the queries you will be making here today, it will be charged 
and and pay by by open air by this initiative and but later yeah sorry i, I want to say that that um i, I tried the um, i tried myself the 300 credit in three months and i i can assure you that uh the three the three months came earlier than i finished the credit i mean i wasn't i wasn't doing a phd as uh as alison was mentioning <laughs> i was trying to set up this um this training and I haven't worked on that every single day, but I've done, you know, like I've done lots of things, having virtual machines, loading data and uh, trying to do tests and so on. And I didn't, I didn't cap that. So for me, the, the problem was just, it was more about time than spending that money. It depends on what you do, but mostly, yeah. And I, I should not say that, but I have six Google accounts. <laughs> Regret it. You, you, and since you can share the data set from one account to another, you, you already know what I mean. <laughs> so uh, next one. Then so uh, now it's for you. <laughs> okay. Open air. Uh, we started a long time ago. Once upon a time, 2009, it rhymes. Uh, there was a never increasing availability of scholarly information, and this was mostly due of the Budapest Open Access Initiative declaration that was back in 2001 or two, I can't remember really. And, um, and there were uh, open access repositories popping up uh, everywhere from all sorts of institutions and organizations, and that was a huge wealth of information. And uh, it was another, you know, another way to get uh, data for free. And uh, and on top of that, there were also uh, starting, there was a, a wave of uh, registries coming, uh, registries for people, projects, and people, you think about ORCID, I think it started in 2011 or 12, and projects, if you, if you can think about CORDIS for the European Union, uh, for the for the European Commission, and uh, and so on and so forth. So there was you know like this golden nugget of free data, and we want to make something out of it. And the main idea of of open air uh, was to provide a single entry point to discover all the possible uh, research outcomes, research products out there, and stats, pretty much like a. Uh, a global uh, virtual uh, current research information system and monitor open access and research impact for funders and institution and research communities without stealing them from the light, pointing them always to the, to the original source of information, so not flashing PDFs, but always just metadata pointing back to your PDFs in the original place. And... Um, the orchestration, the, the, the rules of uh, engagement here uh, are, are mediated by what the content acquisition policies and, and open air guidelines. So if you if you go on this website here, you, there will, you can see uh, lots of different guidelines that apply to different kinds of data providers. And, uh, and each guideline basically um, dictates which are the rules of engagement of that, uh, that data provider. Uh, mostly, like we ingest data from OEI PMH endpoints, so that that's a protocol to share uh, metadata in various formats or FTP or REST APIs, and um, and then each guideline explains which are the metadata formats that are allowed, the application provides the relevant application provides mandatory recommended optional fields, and uh, and uh, it it also um, content acquisition policies um, state which kind of content can be ingested. At the beginning was just open access. Now we moved also to closed access. And, um, and also there's a, a service provide, which is uh, basically the one shop stop service for anyone that, that wants to provide data uh, to be ingested inside open air. And it's like a dashboard where they can see uh, how the data complies to the guidelines and uh, what can be changed and improved. So uh, Open Air is a global initiative. Again, uh, we are uh, collecting from uh, from sources all around the world. 
and uh, in uh, so the idea is nowadays is is about having an open uh, scientific knowledge graph SKG for short. Uh, that's the new uh, nomenclature that's been established in the last years. Uh, so an SKG of interlinked metadata about research products with uh, access right information collect, uh, connected to funding information, organization, the authors, communities, and much more. So the, 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 the core entities that are uh, modeled by the open air uh, data model are these ones that you see here pictured. And you can see that uh, what, what we always, uh, as scientometricians, we, we always think is central is the research product. And in our case, it can be of four different kinds, publication, data, software, and other. Publication, uh, it, it's, um, we, are, we are thinking about moving a bit things around. Uh, there are, um, maybe, maybe this claim is a bit anticipating things. I don't know if it's, uh, but there are, for example, patents that now they are, uh, or clinical trials, the clinical trials are now uh, within the data uh, bucket. Uh, pro but sometimes the clinical trial look more like a paper than, than data. Where data, you would expect to have um, tables, um, zip files, archives, these kind of things. So there might be in the future a bit of shuffle, but the main categories are these ones. And as I was saying, it's uh, old products are connected to persons. So who's... Uh, authoring uh contributing to the to the product in the making uh pro projects that possibly have funded uh, the research stream data sources from where the, the research products are collected from organizations again that are involved or contributed to the to the to the making of that particular outcome and communities as well so in sheer numbers, uh, the open air graph encompasses um, over 283 million dedicated publications. Then we have uh, above uh, more than 40 million data sets uh, collected from uh, almost 200 funders. Then software is about uh, uh, 120,000. Uh, and uh, 4 million different funded grants uh, and uh, half million, about half million of uh, organizations collected from uh, over um, 100,000 data sources. And all these are interconnected by semantic relations. And um, you, can, you can see the dump on Zenodo uh, and it's over, uh, I, I will show that afterwards from, from my laptop, you don't need to go now. Uh, it's over 280 gigabyte compressed, which is which is a daunting size, which basically prevents you from doing anything. Like we put it there for transparency reasons, but we and it's it gets downloaded and viewed, but we uh, we we know that that kind of asset can be um, useful for a limited amount of people, and this is what leads us to uh, this kind of training. And uh, so the core values that are embodied by uh, the opener graph is openness, because everything that it's either CC0 or CC BY, anything that we do is free in, and uh, is not our intention to uh, lure you in and then make you pay for the data. Is not inside the business plan of open air and uh, open air, according to, to, to our philosophy, the data is, is free and should remain free. What is uh, what, what open air makes uh, other people uh, char charging for is is uh, added value services and dashboards. So, um, I mean, this is the current uh, business plan. And um, then we strive for completeness. And this translates from the fact that uh, we try to aggregate from uh, all possible sources around. Uh, not limiting to particular, it's not like, um, you, you, if you're familiar with the with, uh, web of science, you know that the sources, so the, the venues that they uh, index, uh, is a, there's a selection policy behind that. So in, in open air, instead, we, we try to be as inclusive as possible. So we, we possibly ingest the same thing multiple times from multiple um, sources, just in the trying to, 
in the in the in the in the effort of being as complete as possible. We did duplicate everything, so we have an effort in trying to reconcile uh, different instances of the same thing, because exactly we might have collected the same the same uh, meta the same I mean different metadata description of the same physical object, the same article, let's say, from multiple parties. We try to have a, a, a deduplicated representation of that. And we do that in a transparent way because all the processes and algorithms and components that we uh, have in place are described. If you go on the website, the, the, the documentation or the opener graph, there is a link uh, afterwards. If you, I included that in this, not in this slide, but the, the, it will appear uh, at the later stage. Is participatory, participatory and and decentralized because uh, anyone, I mean anyone can can uh, participate. So as I was saying, uh, anyone could uh, that has suitable data to be ingested could could request to be in to be aggregated, and um, and uh, we also have a mechanism for uh, providing feedback. So uh, validated users of the open air uh, portal can uh, assert claims that then are superimposed over the data that we collect and, and potentially can patch you know, in a, an incremental way, striving to the, to the perfect representation of reality. That's the grain, the grand uh, objective. And trusted because again, it's, uh, we are an, an organization that's been running for for uh, over 20 years now and um, and uh, and then so yeah i mean it's um not 20 years that why i was uh, i was a bit shocked over 10 years and then, and uh, so like the European Commission knows us, and uh, we are part. We are we we partner in many in many different initiatives, and uh, we won't disappear. Basically, it's a, it's not. Uh, if you are afraid of uh, the Microsoft uh, academic graph uh, aftermath, well, with with open air, the chances are lower because we we have been we have a solid uh, machinery uh, that 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 goes on. So the graph is constructed by a uh, quite long uh, workflow, but basically, like if we want to to make it in, in in a dehydrated version, like we as I was saying, we collect it, we collect content from compatible sources and from non-compatible sources, so, such as Crossref, Datasat, Orchid, PubMed. Then the records are merged by ID, so things that potentially are are the same. Uh, different representation of the same object are conflated, then PDFs uh, kick in. So all sorts of uh, uh, mining from PDFs, such as organizations and knowledgements uh, and so on, subjects, uh, other kind of SDGs and uh, other topics, they, they are mined out of PDFs and injected as metadata. Then there's a cleaning phase which tries to normalize uh, certain fields according to certain semantics and standards, for example, dates and other fields according to control vocabularies which are uh, documented online. Uh, and then the, this row graph enters in a uh, mid stage uh, where it gets deduplicated. And then there's, uh, there are algorithms about, um, so the duplication is just trying to uh, remove um, duplicates and, and, and conflate different representation of the same thing. Deduction and propagation, it's, it's about creating, uh, augmenting, let's say, metadata by, by uh, inferring um, other, other uh, relations and, uh, and other metadata properties from certain conditions. Then indicators ingestion. Uh, we have two uh, services that provide indicators that are pre-cooked. So they are pre-cooked outside open air. Uh, they are not calculated on, on the wealth of data that we are collecting the different sources. And, uh, and one is BeepFinder, which provides citations. And um, 
and uh, different different flavors of citations. And the other one is a usage count that provides uh, usage and download and views about unconventional research, research products. And, um, or in any case, unconventional metrics about research products. And, uh, and then it gets into a final state before being indexed for uh, serving Explore and Connect. Explore is the web portal and Connect is the, um, is the dashboard for uh, communities. And, uh, and, and once it, the graph is, is, is finalized, it also uh, feeds the stat generation that, that, uh, that in turn feeds mo the monitor and open science observatory services. So uh, we try to do these uh, for production and beta, uh, the environment tentatively, tentatively once per month, and we run on limited budget and person and time. And this task is distributed around Europe, so mostly it's three uh, countries involved. Poland is where the data center is, and then our team in Italy uh, and another team in Greece that's mostly uh, responsible for, for mining. Um, so as you can imagine, data sources can be nasty and data and data can be flickering. And this triggers uh, jitters in the graph. Chunks of data can get lost at any time uh, because data source might have changed the data representation or, or uh, provide less records at a specific uh, time for some mistakes. And the, the whole infrastructure is an evolution, is constant development. There's new data to be included, new algorithms and, new, and old ones that are changing, new curation, claims, whitelisting, blacklisting, and other complexity that comes in all, all the time because this, we, are, we are called to do different things, uh, new things. So it's complex to track errors, mostly like if we get garbage in, we cannot provide something better out. So I, I will show you an example afterwards, after the break uh, with one of the first queries. And and sometimes checking uh, anomalies, it's really hard to reproduce and potentially non-deterministic. So it add, adds complexity to the maintenance and quality checks. As I was saying, uh, the graph feeds uh, a set of uh, portfolio of, of services. So Connect is, is, is a dashboard for basically for is a one one stop shop place for research communities provide is for whomever wants to join open Air and provide content explore is the web portal online that's public for everybody monitor it's a dashboard that uh, shows stats and pre cooked uh, indicators and metrics for various stakeholders and develop is the is the service that that provides access to to the more tech savvy guys that wants to do things through the APIs. So uh, as, as I was saying, the the dump, uh, let me show you here, the dump from the latest one, from Zenodo, it's, uh, medium? Uh, it's 280 gigabytes. And it's uh, these many files hosted on Zenodo. And uh, I mean, you might have challenges in downloading that on your laptop, uh, provided you have space. But even if you download that, then the question is, what do you do with that? And uh, despite being documented, everything is, uh, is let me watch the documentation here. Um, everything is documented, so you know what the data model is and where to find information. So, and yet, uh, it gets downloaded, it gets viewed, but we think, I mean, from talking with the, with the people that should be, I mean, from the scientometrician community, they should be the, the, the first one to be inter interested in uh, this kind of asset. We discovered that that's kind of uh, difficult to, to exploit, and this prevents the uptake. So, uh, Together with Alison, we started a long, a long-standing conversation on 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 making uh, things easier for people, and uh, and so what happens now is that basically the Zenato snapshot is downloaded on a virtual machine on on Google. 
all the data gets uh, loaded onto um, a data set, database, where the table have fake uh, columns, because the column is, is a JSON, is a JSON file. And then the JSON file gets, I mean, this, this data set here is, is totally workable. Uh, it's totally fine, but it's easier to have uh, final tables with extracted fields and um, and also this entails lower costs because you don't you are not forced to read the whole uh, JSON file to get uh, the field that you that you might need. So in this step here, you really uh, take I mean, by doing this step, we take a really advantage of data parallelism of column parallel parallelism. So after this training, so this this data set that that's now on Google for the hands-on session uh, is not uh, public yet. It's restricted to uh, our the the Google group that uh, we were I was sharing before. I was showing before. After the training in the late in the next months, uh, it will be our care to uh, publish uh, a public data set on Google BigQuery. And, and have it refreshed every six months. So pretty much every um, product in our portfolio for uh, exploitation and uptake will be in sync. So the, the dump on Zenodo and uh, the BigQuery data set and um, the beginner's kit that I will show you afterwards will be always updated at the same time with the latest version from the graph. So you, here at, the, at this training are kind of uh, guinea, guinea pigs uh, and uh, suggestions are welcome. So if you think that there's something that uh, prevents from using these resources, you think that something different should be, uh, something should be organized uh, differently, uh, your suggestion is precious and is welcome because it could uh, steer us to make things in a, in a, in a better way. Once the once the public uh, data set on on uh, BigQuery, is on BigQuery, uh, then it can be queried at, at own expenses. So now that it's private, I had to invent you in uh, in uh, open as uh, Google Cloud project. But once it will be out for everybody to be accessed, in principle, you can create your own project, uh, activate the voucher, and start querying. Uh, start start querying the data set. In any case, stay tuned because uh, there will be an efficient uh, uh, announcement about about the the next release of this. So I was saying uh, the documentation between the documentation that you can see online and the schema of the tables that you will see on Google Cloud. There's a basically one on one mapping. In some cases, some fields have been. Um, uh, let's say uh, made more user friendly. So it, rather than going into into a JSON column, there will be already columns uh, ready to be used. But it's pretty it's pretty one on one. So what you see on the documentation, it's and and uh, makes sense to you in terms of uh, information to be fetched can be found as a column on uh, on BigQuery. These are the tables that are available. So basically, there's our friendly publications, article thesis, peer-reviewed uh, material, uh, peer-reviewed material, uh, blog posts, books, reports, and patents. Data set that is basically anything with persistent uh, identifier that that's a digital asset intended for um, con to contain data for meant for processing. So tables, metadata collection, dumps, whatever, and software, which refers to uh, source uh, source code, files, algorithms, scripts, workflows, and so on. Other, which it's, I haven't been used that much to be honest, but it's uh, it's another uh, it's a, a catch-all table that contains all other kinds of uh, research product that do not fit in the previous uh, three categories. Data sources, which is uh, contains metadata referring the services that um, where the um, uh, material got aggregated from, and this is another one that I don't use much for uh, scientometric research. Uh, I mean, at least I I, I didn't come up with uh, with uh, two significant um, theories that involve this table. 
And then we have organization. So academic institution, centers, inst what kind of other institution that takes part of the research process project. So uh, funding information grants. Uh, communities re uh, contains uh, a small amount of, of, of research communities that are registered in open air. It's 30 of them. Uh, so if you remember from what I was saying before, uh, there's a service which is provide and provide talks to communities. These are the communities uh, this table retains. And then relation. Relation is um, the only table that puts uh, into, into um, connection all the others. And we will see that, that uh, later, but it's basically the bridge to resolve any to to make to jump from one entity to another, any one of those. Okay, so uh, this is a, a, a bit of an advertisement for another activity. Uh, we have also uh, a, a no cost asset free zero configuration alternative to uh, to be tried out, which is uh, it has been presented uh, at STI uh, in September. You can find it on GitHub here, and it's basically a Docker container that 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 virtualizes uh, Apache Hadoop uh, on your on your local machine, and makes you access with a cluster in a in a clusterized way, uh, a, a subset of um, of open air run queries uh, on top of that, and which is something that you wouldn't you you couldn't do in uh, to in memory with with scripts uh, with with a Python script, for example. So it it's yeah, it's too good to be true because it runs on only on six months worth of data from the open air graph. But still, it's something, and uh, with just two lines of uh, of code, it, it's ready to be run. And uh, you can use Sparkle SQL syntax, uh, which is similar to the dialect uh, that we see, uh, the, the SQL dialect that we see here in, uh, in, in in Google Cloud. But as the the upper hand, it doesn't cost anything, so you can try, you you can really uh, with a few lines of code. Uh, get started. Try something on your on your uh, on your machine. Try to see what what is all about, and then if you feel committed enough, then uh, at the later stage you could move uh, to Google Cloud and start spending your voucher. But again, it's free at the beginning, so you have both options. We think that that uh, the the more the merrier, right? So the more options you have, the better the better it is. And now back to Alison. Alison, you wanna you wanna share your screen? Yes, I think it's easier. Yeah. yeah. Let me. Um, can you steal my? Okay, I'll, I'll stop. I, yeah, I think I can. Share. If I move to presentation, right? It's not sure. You see it well? Fine. Great. So let's talk a little bit about SQL. So structured query language. So in the past it was called with two uh E's and a U SQL. Uh, some, some people still pronounce it that way because because of that. So it, it's a, a language, it's not a programming language, but it's a, a data. Uh, modeling language that allows uh, to query and build and maintain relational databases, right? Relational data. In, in the sense there is a mathematical theory these days that describes that every computer science undergraduate course will have at least one or two uh, semesters dealing with that. But uh, it's it has become since the 70s such a widespread language, both in industry, commercial applications, that it, it's worth the try. It's worth it's, uh, learning a little bit of it because you will not be using just here and Google BigQuery. If you have a local server, it will be useful. Other tools also use it. And it, it, it's built, since it's built to query and to maintain data, it's optimized in that direction, right? So a query is a request for data. And, and, and that's most what we do. Of course, SQL is larger than that. You have commands to 
build databases, build tables and data sets, which are collections of tables. Also to add users, to define the permissions of users to access or to change uh, particular portions of data, also to define and redefine tables, to update tables. There are comments for everything related to data management, creation, etc. Uh, for example, you have comments such as this. We're, you're not going to be using a lot of that. So you have, you have comments that work on BigQuery. You can use them if you have the privileges to create table, to change the table, add a column, create a column, drop a table, erase it, uh, truncate, to rename a table, all these this things. And there is also more regular processing tools that be inserting new data, updating, changing the values in a row of a table, to delete a row, to merge uh, rows into one, etc. All these uh, tools are there. What is a table, just as a standard definition, we can talk about table is this figure, this tabular thing where you have rows and columns. And we understand that our types of data are expressed in columns. So you have the column names and we force them to be of the same types. Namely, a column uh, is an integer. I mean, all the rows in, in this column will be integers or will be decimal uh, floating point values or will be strings with text or will be data format, date formats. And so the type is defined in the column itself. You cannot have, as is usual in today's programming languages, lists, something that contains different types of data in the same structure that's indexed by a number. Because in the end, very deep in the machine, that's an illusion, right? You, you cannot have an index to position when every element is of a different type because you cannot really decide how large is the type beforehand. So the table, the tabular environment forces you to be in every column of the same type, addressing every element on it is just the index of the row times the size of the element. So that's why things get way more optimized uh, when you're talking to or about real tables, right? And you have an identifier for the row, which in our case will be a number for the row as an, an integer number, and you have a table name. And tables will be organized here in sets of tables, data sets, namely data sets. And these are the most important comments, and I will advise you even to, after some exercises, you will be memorizing this because this is the subset of the language. They find it to query for information, to collect information from a table. You have select that will really make a projection of the table, extract columns, select the columns. This is one of the most important things because inside a, a cloud environment, this defines the work, the computational load and the price that you're paying. Because uh, if you choose the columns you need, the size of the column is the amount of, of information that you are shuffling, that you are mobilizing. Then that's the amount uh, that you're really spending in terms of, of computational power. From is defines the address of the table you are querying. And uh, uh, address can be full, project name, data set name, table name. Project means uh, the project that inside the context of the cloud infrastructure created the data set. Data set is this, is, are those blocks of information that combine several tables, <coughs> this pools of information. And the table name is the structure. Uh, the data sets in and the cloud infrastructure, they can have their own uh, localization properties. So a data set can be placed in North America, in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in the sense that they are easily and transparently accessed from all this within this region, right? And where is our instruction to filter, to select rows from the table? So if select chooses columns where chooses rows <clears throat> you can think that way <clears throat> then you have uh, organizational uh, command like order by it will sort the rows according to a particular criterion usually the criterion would be the values of a particular column you can show a certain column but ordered by another column or by some operation of another column or even by a combination of several columns and then you have group by <clears throat> To, I'll explain later, is when you take values of a certain column as repeated and then you group 
the rows uh, according to this uh, repetitions. And then you have having is just like where, but instead of being applied to select rows, it's applied to filter aggregations, to filter something that have been grouped but by group by, right? You have this link. Well, you, if you collect the slides from the link at the beginning, you have this query syntax that uh, summarizes everything we're saying here. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a real one <clears throat> so you can have some idea how it works. So this is a real simple query. You have select something from a table, a filter, and this keyword limit. Well, select asterisk or star, if you prefer. It means all the columns. Oh, uh, and there I put the link here. So star or asterisk here mean all means all the columns. <coughs> from is uh, the table. So the, here the address of the table is not fully, but partially qualified. I, I'm not using the project name, which in this case means that implicitly we are taking the project that we are using to run. Uh, this doesn't have to be implicit because I could query tables from a different project, even running at a particular project, right? And then I will have to put the project's name here to completely uh, define the address. But here, if since I don't provide the project name, it's implicit that's the one I'm working. And then you have data set name, in this case, OAG247, open air ref, dot, it's all, all parts are separated by dot, publications, which is the table we are querying. So I am selecting all the columns in table publications. If I just stop there in these two rows and run it, this first two rows, it will show me the whole publications table because I'm taking all of it, all the columns. But I will not show all the columns, I mean, all the rows. I will show some rows. And I will define this by filtering the rows using the where statement. So where I will select something. Then I could use logical operators as we are about to see. I can choose functions. And there is a, a large family of functions to make your life easier so to speak. So there is, for example, this function contains subst that contains substring that it will operate on column names. So column names are like variables here ever since I call for the particular table. So main title with a capital T is a column name, is a field name inside table publications. So this function asks for two parameters. You will see how it works. You pass the column name and the text you are looking for within it, given that this column name is a text, is a string of characters. So this function will render out true in case the set of characters COVID COVID is contained within the text of the column main title. So for all the rows, it would output true or false. True if COVID is found within the string, false if not. And then taking this three, this first three rows, this first three three line of lines of code, I will output not just the full publications table, but the, all the columns in publications table where the column called main title contains COVID as uh, as a substring as a portion of it. And then this is a query that will show me all the publications with COVID on the title and all its metadata because I use asterisk to show all the columns. This last statement, limit five, will show me just the first five results. This is mostly a trial and error uh, keyword just to see if I'm getting right, etc. Because it the fact that I limit the output, it does not limit the amount of data I have to process because once I call for the whole column, I have to test the whole column for the, for the value I am I'm filtering. Uh, then in the end, it does not change the, the amount of processing. It's just to output and test. So summarizing, this is how it works. I select the columns. I choose the table. Uh, project not mentioned means it's taken implicitly. And where is the, the filter that I can use with functions that output true or false, or I can use it with combinations of logical operators. Uh, and then I can go a little further. Now I can... Apply aggregations on this, right? Uh, we just uh, uh, first before going to aggregations. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Instead of querying over all the columns, I can select the columns. For example, I can from that table publications, publications select the publications where main title contains COVID, but I will just show the type 
if it's an article, if it's a book, if it's a monograph, the main title where there will be eventually COVID as a part of it and the list of authors. Then I just want to see these three elements. And if I run this, the resulting will be similar to the previous query, but it will not show all the metadata, just these three. And this is a very healthy uh, habit, a very hygienic habit, because then I am only charged by the, the, the amount of data in these three columns, not in the whole uh, data set. And that's one of the advantages that you have by splitting your data conveniently into several columns, right? And then I am really, this is an habit you should develop, avoid using this asterisk unless for very exploratory reasons, because anyway, you can check the column names in the interface without running any query as you, I have just show you, but you will see again. So if you just want to see the column names and types, you don't have to query anything. You just click on details about the column and you can see it. Um, but then you try to eventually always force yourself to define what do you want to see and then really type in the column names. So now I'm going to aggregations and how do they work? There are several aggregating functions, right? These are the most common. If you remember, you will probably remember this by memory. There was more count, sum, average, min, and max. Count would be for a collection of rows, it will just count the number of, of, row, of valid rows. For example, it will not, it will not count nodes. Right, just valid rows for that field. Uh, some it will sum the, the numbers in that selection of rows if they are numbers to, to be summed, right? Like integers or floating points. There is automatic uh, casting, right? If you mix integers and floats, but in, in this, in, in the BigQuery environment, this, this means very little because you already force columns to be of the same type. And averaging means already taking the, the arithmetic average, mean and max is to output, is to result the minimum value and the maximum value of a certain column. And of course, these all apply to an aggregation. They apply to a collection, a subcollection of rows from within a table. And how, which portion then you define by the aggregation, right? Uh, and I will show you. But you, of course you have countless of these aggregating functions. For example, you have all the statistic functions. You can have standard deviation, you can have variance and, and uh, non-normal estimators, everything that can be calculated on a portion. You can even have machine learning functions, um, trigonometric functions, if uh, usual mathematics that you can be do doing with, uh, with tables and uh, over a set of, of values, right? So all these aggregating functions, they work on a portion or on a series of data that will be combined using the group by, using the aggregation, right? So how does that work? I'll show you an example. Again, I'm working on table publications within the data set OAG 24-7. This time I am selecting publication date, which is a column name, a field name in table publications. And I want to count how many publications every publication date. So I will use the aggregating function count. Count asterisk means I am looking for all the columns. If they have some new value in any of the columns, it will count, right? If I wanted to count for non-new values within a specific column, I would just put the column name here instead of asterisk within the parenthesis. And here I'm using this new tool of giving a nickname, of giving an alias to the column names. So publication date, I am now henceforth calling year and counting the number henceforth n pubs. Uh, in this case, when I when I use, when I apply a, an aggregating function, uh, there is no automatic naming for the output, for, for the result, because the result of a query is always another table. And the, there will have to be a column name if you're just querying from a table outputting column names, the column name repeats, but when I apply aggregating functions, there is no definition for the column name. It's usually used F0, F1, F2, et cetera, but then I can nickname it to make it clearer, to make it easier to understand. Then I am querying publication date from table publications. I'm renaming it in the result as year and count is my aggregating function that I will create a number over a collection 
of rows in this table. Which collection? Then I have the third line, group by year. So for every distinct value of year, which originally was publication date, for every distinct value of year, there will be a collection of rows that have the same value as publication date, namely as year. And then for all these uh, rows with the same value for year, there will be a collection to which apply the aggregate function, namely count. So uh, the resulting table will have as many rows as distinct values for year. And the, the, the second column, NPUBs, will be the number of rows, of non-new rows in case, of rows for every one of these distinct values, right? So this is how it works. I define a certain column to be singled, to be dis made distinct in its values, and the number of repetitions for every distinct value in the original table will become just a counting of this, of non-new values. In this case, will be non-new rows because I'm putting asterisk. And then just to make it easier to see, it's very common. I order by year descending, right? I group order by year desk. It means that the, the rows will be explicitly shown by the, the first by the smallest, which means the, the, the oldest uh, year, and then the more recent years in, in, this, uh, in this ordering. So in the, every time you use an aggregation, this is the standard, this is the pattern that you must follow. follow. And for the select statement in the first row here, you will are, remember in the select statement, you are creating the columns of the resulting table. So in this case, when using an aggregation, all the fields that you name separated by commas, all the columns in the resulting must be either grouped or aggregated. So the columns must be all either in the group by or they must be aggregated by an aggregated function. So you see, I have two columns in the resulting table. The first is something that's aggregated, uh, group, something that's grouped, grouped by. And the second is something that's being applied to an aggregated function, count. If I have further columns, they will have to be either grouped by, then I will have grouped, they will have to be grouped by further columns, or aggregated by their repetitions using an aggregated function. Of course, if I have more than one column in the group by statement, I will, I will be selecting not the distinct value of one, but the distinct value of their combination, right? So I can use all this. I know it's a lot of information. If you are familiar uh, with uh, SQL, you're already just having a revision. If you are not, there will be lots of exercises to know, but you just try to get the, the concept uh, here. I can combine all this with operations such as arithmetical operations, comparisons, set comparisons, and logical operations. You have the traditional plus, uh, minus for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You have value comparisons, equals, equals here is just one equal sign, uh, exclamation mark equals is different, or you have this uh, greater, smaller signal to be different. Then you have, uh, I mean, greater and smaller for greater and smaller, and greatest equals to smaller equal to. And you also have uh, between for a range of values. You also have to, you can also test if a value is null or not by is null or is not null. You have a like, which is an operation that looks for a pattern uh, or in a string. So it's uh, easier, way of, of uh, expressing a uh, subset of regular expressions. You have comparison sets if you want to compare, compare. If a value is within a certain set of possibilities, you use in or not in if it's not in it. And you have the traditional logical operators and or not. And all of this can be combined in any of the fields of a query, right? So let me apply an example. I will aggregate and I will filter. Right. Um, so uh, in this case, I am not taking publication date as a whole and call it year. I am using a function. Again, there is a countless number of functions for you to learn. You just have to look for some specific particular operation. You look, usually you will find something ready made for you. So you have this uh, uh, function called left that takes the first four characters of a string. Here the date is stored as a string. We can move that on in the, in the future, but I'm taking the first four characters, which are the year. 
Then I'm taking left publication date for the first four characters as year, and I'm nicknaming it year, and I'm counting the publications, just like I did the previous query. But here, I am also grouping and ordering, but I am adding a filter. A filter goes uh, after I define the table and before I group it, because the filtering is applied over individual elements of the rows. So it has to be before grouping. If I want to apply a filtering over the grouping, over the aggregating, then I have the other uh, keyword called having that we saw in the, in the beginning. So I, am, I want to count the number of publications each year, but now I am not taking the whole date. I'm taking just a year for real. And I want to check in the interval between 2010 and 2019 well, since the year is expressed as a text, I put this quote and quote uh, sign because it's a text. And I say where year greater than equals 2010 and end year uh, smaller than equals 2019. That will give me a range of, of values for the year. You remember that the, the greater than equals sign, uh, they, they are valid uh, for text because they are lexicographic comparison, right? And in, in the case of dates, just year, and it also in the case of dates, if you put year, month in this sequence, that's equivalent to uh, the, the ordering of, of, of date in the calendar, right? So I am now just filtering with for the values of the column I, I created uh, uh, circumstantially here, named, named as year, which will be the first four characters of publication date. So this is what I mean, to pay attention to how data is stored, what are their formats, then you can have special functions to deal with that. For example, there are functions that will convert this into a date format that or, or implicitly has the uh, month and, and year and even hour uh, calculated the exact way if you want to make arithmetics with dates, uh, like adding days, uh, summing days. This is not the case here, but there are functions for that. Just pay attention for that. Um, and this uh, this is a very important thing, right? Because this structure is very common. You use it all the time when you are even, especially when you start to start start a new problem. You take a certain a certain uh, table, and then you want to analyze certain variable over another. So you are grouping, filtering, and ordering. This is if you understand what's happening in all this five uh, rows of lines of code here, you can do more than half of what you need to do and even in this training, right? But this this format is very important. Now I'm going further with join, right? So uh, join is, is what we call a more complex thing. It's not basic query anymore. In, in our two hours practical session, first we will be doing up to this point and we call this basic and then we'll use joins to improve on that. Uh, but join is also part of traditional SQL. Is one want to combine things from more than one table, two, three, etc. But let's start with two because it then expands easily. So you, what you want is, to, if you want to combine, if you need information that's spread across tables, you need to join them. You need to combine in a certain way. So what you do is put them side by side and create a new resulting table. I want you to imagine the join statement and the join of oper joining operation as this, you take two tables and put them side by side to create a new one. But in order to do that, how do you do? You select columns from one and you select columns from the other. You don't have to be doing this with all the columns, implicitly, right? Because that will save you uh, processing, for example. And how the rows are organized, the rows, the, the lines in one and the lines in the other, how they are aligned to create this resulting table. They are, you must inform this explicitly, both, except for one case, you must inform how you're going to take the rows from one and align to the rows to the second when you are selecting columns from both. So these are the two things, the two uh, mathematical operations that you do. You select columns to put them side by side and you indicate how the rows are matched to create this resulting table, right? And you use an index usually from one table matching to the index in the other table to align the rows. Uh, usually you take, if you, you did your data modeling right, you have this index as the same name in both tables that you are joining. If you did your modeling right, or, or, or uh, they will be the same name or they will be a similar name that will indicate 
that they are collected. For example, ID ID, for example, source target, names like that would indicate that they are IDs to match, to identify how the rows should be matched. So there are a few types of joins. I will talk about them in a theoretical way. So, and then if you understand this in, in this conceptual way, then the curve will be easier, right? So you have your table A and table B, the two tables that we want to join. In this case, I am taking all the columns just to simplify this first step. I am dealing just with the connection of the rows. So the resulting table will have all the columns from A and all the columns from B. So I'm, I'm even not showing the select part here that will select tables. So the resulting table, I have to decide how the rows are going to, to be shown here. Uh, first, I have to explicitly say, how do I join these rows? There is the first way is the inner join, which is the standard. The implicitly standard join is to have this. Is I will select what are the index, which is the index in table A, the first one, and which is the index in table B, the second one, that will allow this matching. The statement says it from A in a join B on, and this on explicitly says which value am I using to match the rows. So from column A, I'm using column W, and from column B, I am using column Y. So a dot w equals b dot i. It means I am taking, I, I am putting side by side in my resulting table, the rows from A where column w matches the value of column y in B. This can create uh, uh, replications. If it happens more than once, if it happens twice, I will have two columns. I mean, I will have two rows in the resulting table. So just check. In table A, column W, I have one, two, three, and three. In table B, column Y, I have two, three, three, four. So one in table A does not exist in table B in the same index column, namely uh, W and Y. So one does not appear in the resulting table. This is called the inner join. I do not show what does not come on in both tables. Similarly, is what happens with uh, the value 4 in, in column Y of table B, because there is no matching for this value in table A, so this row will not show in the resulting table. The number 2, the value 2, happens once in table A, column W, and happens once in table I, column B. Then, the combination of these values in table A and B appears, as in this case, the first row of the resulting table. So we have W and Y are two, and they are, of course, they are two because they are the indexes I am choosing to match. And X and Z, that will be the values B uh, and K in tables A and B are shown in the resulting table. For the value three in, in column W and column Y in table B, I have two options each. And then since they match, they will have to match all the way around. So I have I will have four rows in the resulting table because I am taking all possible combinations of this value in table A and B. So it's two occurrences and two occurrences. Two times two, I will have four. Combining all the possibilities of taking the first row with the index three in table A with the first row with the index three in table B and then the first with the second, the second with the first, the second with the second. And then you have what happened here in join. I hope you had understood. That's how it works, the inner join. And then you have cross join, right? As I, I, as I like to say, cross join is, is evil. It's a potentially evil tool because it does not need an index. Why it does not need an index? Because it's implicitly saying all against all. So I'm taking these two tables and I'm taking all the, the, the rows in the first and all the rows in the second and combining them all against all. There's no filtering for that. So if you have large tables, this easily explodes, right? A gigabyte here, a gigabyte there, it explodes to petabytes easily. So uh, my brother works in a data industry company. They say cross-join is forbidden by God. <laughs> this is a joke they have. Of course, I can imagine situations where you use it, but they are exceptional because it's matching everything against everything and creating a table that's the, the true multiplication of one against the other. So you have the outer join, or full full join, 
some people call it, that will be something similar to what we did in the inner join, but I do not forget when I do not find the index. What I do is to fill with null in the other side, in the side that's missing. So in this case, for value one in index W column A, I find no match in column B. If I find no match, I fill it with null. Then you can see what happens in the first row. Similarly to value four in table B, I do not find a match for the left table, table A. Then I just fill the, the, the fields with nulls. So is the resulting of is the result of inner join, but added in adding nulls for every time I do not find um, a match, right? In, in both sides. And then I have the simpler cases when I fill it new just when the left side is missing, and I fill it new just when the right side is missing, giving me the right join and the left join. For example, the left join only fills the right-hand side second table when it's missing in the value for its index or the other way around only once the left side is missing. In practice, what you usually 90 something percent of times you use is the inner join, the first one, and the left join. Of course, left and right join, they are equivalent, right? You just invert the order of tables and you get the same results from left and right join. But you use inner join when you want to join what exists and you use left join or alternatively right join, and use left join when you want, you have this table as a reference and I want to see how it matches information to another table and when the information is missing and I want to see the nodes and I, or I want to count the nodes, etc. So these are the most, the two uh, most common situations and the most common types of join that we are using, right? Any questions up to now? This was all abstract, but I'm going to show now uh, an example with tables, with select statement. You can raise your hand, interrupt in a moment. So here I am taking two tables from the OpenAI graph, the table relations mentioned by Andrea and the table projects, right? The table relations is the table that we join all around in this, uh, at, at least in the way the model is uh, placed in BigQuery now. So the table relations contains uh, the IDs for all everything in, in open air and how they relate to each other. I mean, there is a relation, this relates to that and the type of the relation, a description in all the columns of how this relationship happens and <clears throat> what's the meaning of that. Let's say I want just to investigate how the projects relate to other things in, big, in, in BigQuery's open air, right? How the projects relate. So I, I'm taking, I'm joining table relations to table projects. And I want to see the type of relation and the type of source, and the type to which it is connected. So I use this select, where I select the columns of the resulting table, or the, the resulting table could possibly mean columns from either tables. I use the join and I use the own to provide the index for where the index that will make the rows match, like I said. So I am I'm using us again as nicknaming. I use it before to nickname columns. Here I'm using to uh, give an alias to a table. So open open our graph 24 7 dot relations, table relations in the data set, it will be called A. And project tables in the data set will be called B. You notice here I'm 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 using this uh backtick in Portuguese is the grave accent, is the marker for the grave, it's a backtick. Uh, this is used to address tables in Google BigQuery. It is not needed. It's optional in this case. It is mandatory when you have table names with special characters and spaces and uh, unusual non-Latin characters. But in this case, it's optional because the names are all regular characters without spaces, etc. Right? Just to inform. This is different from the quote-unquote to for texts. Well, okay. Then I am joining the tables again. Uh, on So I take from table A, namely table relations, I'm taking the column called target, which will be a target ID. That table you can check, it has targeted source. And I am matching to the ID of the project. So when the project is the target of a relation. And I am putting in the output, the target type, I mean, which kind of entity is relating to the project, and what is the source of this, what is the type of this entity that's relating to the project? I'm showing this. In this case, I am taking columns just from the first table. 
in this case, the purpose of joining is just to select, is I'm using the join as a filter. <clears throat> it's just to select when I am relating to projects. So I'm taking from all the relations, only the relations that are related to project because I am not showing anything from the project itself. Of course, I could add other columns to the select statement saying, I want to see the project name. I want to see the project, I start date, for example, right? So this is how it works, the join. I have one table, or the table. I use an alias to, to make it easy to, to join. I use on to specify through an equal sign which column on the first, which column on the second is, uh, is being matched, is being used to match the rows. And I select the columns from the possible, possibly from both uh, tables to show as my resulting table, right? I select what I want to show to see in the combination of both columns and how do I make the rows match. Here I have used join, which implicitly means in a join. Just, I would just show in the resulting table something that appears in the first, something that appears in the second. If I wanted to do left join, full join, right join, I just add this word before join. I will write left join, right join, for example, right? I could also combine with other things and I can combine with anything. For example, I want to count in this case, I want to count all types of relationship the project has in the open air graph. So I will group by target type and source type. So I'm making every distinct combination of both. I can have repetitions on target type, but for different source type. I can have repetition of soft types, types but for different target types. And then for the combination of both, how often, how many times do I have a project relating to something else? Then I count BID. I'm counting distinct values. I'm, I mean, I'm counting no new. I'm counting no new values for the project ID, which in this case are also distinct because ID is distinct in the table project. So I count BID. B is table B, the ID. Table B is the table project. And I nickname it N. So in the resulting, I will have a target type and a source type. So what type of entity is being related to project and uh, how it is, this, what, what's the type of this source and how often, how many times that happened? This will be the resulting table. And um, that's why I'm using group by in an aggregating function. So I'm finding the number of type of relations of relationships to projects. So this is an example of using the join and combining with an aggregation. Lastly, the last um, function of our uh, SQL that I'm going to use is uh, unnest, right? Uh, this is something historically new in SQL, but it's not so new anymore. In the last decade, it has been uh, applied in all most uh, SQL servers, not just BigQuery and Microsoft SQL Server, even uh, local servers, because it allows for a field in a table to be composite, to be mutable. So I can have, I have a column that's a number. In an element, I can have an array of numbers if a field is defined to be nested or repeated. Here in BigQuery, it's called repeated if you look at the schema details, right? Uh, and then I, I can have several values, again, of a uniform type, otherwise it would make no sense. It makes the query more complex because you have to unnest or not nest or to choose a position, etc. But it simplifies management and it simplifies the modeling of the graph. So it's a trade-off. Usually what we do is to unnest things that we use a lot and to keep it nested things that we use sparingly, mostly like that. Uh, so for every obvious set, it's very useful. For example, for a publication, there is a list of authors and, and you can put all the authors' names in a, in a, in a nested field in an array of authors, right? And of course, it's always possible to write code to create unnested tables where everything will be in a different row, repeating some ID or the other values. Or just to do it on the spot, to do it while you're building a query. And while you're, to do it while you're building a query, you can use the unnest function. I'll give an example here, just uh, for, for the authors. So I am, um, again, querying the table publications. So from our data set, table publications, you will see there is a field called author, 
but the field is nested. It has repeated values because you can have possibly many authors. So I, I, I put a comma after the table name from table name comma, and I add a nest author, which is the field that is nested. And I use as a, a new name. This new name that we'll call pub author will be the unnested version of author, namely one author every row. And then what happens when I do this is I implicitly take this original publication tables and I expand it, creating new rows for every author in the that were originally nested in one field. So I create this expanded version. And then now with this new from statement, from publications, comma, unnest, blah, 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 now I have this expanded version, and then now I can reason with this new field name I created, which is the unnested version of author. It's called pub author, and I can query naturally again as I was used to. So I, since this field is also in a JSON because it has full name, surname, given name, etc., I use JSON value, which is a function that can query JSON values from inside a string. I pass pub author, which will be just one author since it's the field that's already unnested. And I look for full name. This uh, dollar sign dot a field name is to address the value of JSON fields, right? And then I nickname this full name. I can now combine to an aggregation. So to take all equal full names, so implicitly if full names are disambiguated, the same author, and I am counting how many publications. So I'm counting distinct IDs, right? And here I have to count the ID because if I just count, I will, I will, I will get multiple, uh, multiple values because I am unnesting works. So I'll count distinct ID for number of publications. If I group by full name, again, I am combining the query with grouping and aggregating function, but from an ex expanded table where I unnest rapid, uh, nested values in a particular field, giving a nickname to this unnested value, right? But now this is the set of tools that you will need, right? I'll, I'll just go quickly through it again. So you will have most of you need this, uh, this set of, uh, of keywords, of reserved words for the queries, select from where order by group by having. I showed you how do you select from a table columns and filter given a certain value, combining logical operators and functions. I can select through the column only the columns I want. I must I can group them and then what I do not group, I aggregate to apply aggregating functions that will take several rows and produce a single value. Uh, I can order the results to see, and this is the first level of basic queries that you use a lot in exploratory stage. Everything can be combined with logical and arithmetical operations. I can apply filter together, filtering together with grouping and ordering. And I can then again, I explain the concept of joining several tables. I'm, I'm just applying to two, but it's expandable to several. In a join, cross join, left and right. And then I showed you example of join and the unnest that allows you to expand tables where field names were, were repeated, uh, you have several values in a certain field, right? And I'll show you an example again. I think now uh, we have a break, Andrea. Yeah, we are basically on time. So far, so good. Uh, so let's uh, take an hour for us, uh, grab a coffee. And then when we are back, we start with the... Uh, with, um, uh, batches the of, exercises the exercise yes so um, we have the slides but uh for this session i think it would be more practical to uh to do less context switches switch as possible uh to move to move here uh so a, a, a brief recap on the interface which is daunting at the first time and still is after <laughs> several several uh weeks working in this uh, here on. So uh, you should be on BigQuery. You should see BigQuery here. And if it's selected, then you see this uh, magnifying, uh, this uh, magnifying lens, BigQuery. And then here on the 
uh, left side pan, uh, left 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 hand side panel, you see um, Opener iPhone Graph, which is the name of the project. You should see Opener Graph here on the top, and then these two boxes here are the data sets. The one that you you are going to be working with all the time is this one is OIG 2407, which is uh, 2024 July. JSON, this is other, the other database I was talking about, which has JSON, uh, which has a JSON column, basically. It's a, one, one only column with the old JSON inside. And then when you, if you open that, you see all these tables. And if you click on a table, say publications, you see a bunch you you land on schema and it, please uh re, uh you can react uh you can react with the emo um, emoticons or uh, you can even take the open the mic if you if you if you have a problem that prevents you from moving forward just be vocal be loud let, let, don't i prefer i prefer to get interrupted rather than having you um falling out of the tutorial the training so you see all these uh name these names here which are rows the um, columns and if you click on preview and you start seeing what the table looks like and so for each column that we saw before, here's the content. And here you can drag and reshape just if you want to explore and dig further in, in, in the representation. Now, uh, to get sense of what's inside table, there's another way, which is you go on this, just keep an open tab on, on the documentation page. And then you see here and data model. And then under data model, you see entities, research product, data sources, organization, project, and communities. Mostly it will be about data sources. And here on the right, you see all the fields that are inside data source, uh, the inside pro, uh, publications. And so, so these are uh, common for all research products and therefore publications. Um, So let's, let's start somewhere. I will use these, which is a notebook. This was the way I intended to uh, run the training in the first place, but then it opened up to a plethora of other issues. So uh, I'm using, I mean, I, we created these with tasks and, and, and subtasks to have things organized, but what you need to do is to click here on this plus and you automatically go on untitled query uh, panel. Do I have you all on the same page? If so, so let's do like this. If someone experienced bad things, please shout or say something. If I don't hear anything, it means that everyone is fine. Okay, it looks everyone is fine. I give it. I give it for granted. Uh, so the first task, uh, Alison, before show was showing a query and it's uh, it's about let's start very simple find publications with a keyword in the title and this keyword can be covid or anything else so i will copy this on I, I won't run it from here because i want to i want to show you uh i want to show the same interface that you will see and um so the way the way um the task is find publications with a keyword in the title right so i know the, the way I usually process the request and, and create the query is like this. So I need to, I, I know that I need to work on publications. Okay. And uh, I know that publication has somewhere that information. So I go, either I go on the table and then I shuffle down here till I find the field that looks like uh, the one, the, the best candidate one, which is main title. Or I go to the documentation and I and I rifle through the fields here and then here again, main main title stands out. 
the, the bonus here is that you get a description on 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 what is uh, on uh, what, what is inside with a small example. So, as I was saying, I know that publication is what I need. I know that main title is the is the column I need to uh, check for for uh, a condition, and the condition here is is the is having the substring COVID inside and contain substring is a um, is the function that works best for us. Uh, here, you, another thing you can do is checking for uh, the official documentation. I will, I will just drop it here in the chat. And uh, contains. Contains some, and then this one it says performs normalized case insensitive search to see if the substring is inside the the column main size. Now, um, then I, here, Alison was saying that uh, you can put star. So this one, if you run it, you will see that it runs in a blazing fast time and it returns five uh, records as we were saying because we constrain that if you remove that it will, re will return the whole thing and uh, mm, what I was what I'm missing here just it doesn't okay uh, I mean I don't know if you see that but here on the right usually there's a um, it says uh, how much the okay yeah so for example, now the data uh, because will will process uh, 545 gigabytes. And this would be, so running this query would be roughly three euro. Uh, it's, it's, a not, it's not a, a super um, significant one, but it's good as an example and uh, for, and what I want to show you, and the good thing that, uh, that referred to what Alison was saying, is that you, if you constrain, rather than using star, you, you constrain your query to a specific... Uh, Alison, yeah. Diana? Yeah, sorry, Andrea, can I ask you something? I don't know yeah. why it's not uh, letting me run the query. It says that I need permissions of bigquery.jobs.create. Okay, then then th that's a good thing you, you told me. Uh, then I need to probably... Uh, yeah. Okay, so this was... Uh, I, I I bet uh, okay, so I wait I, I will do I will do two things. Joanna, I will add you right away. No way. <laughs> are you serious? Yes, we have to all the time be proving we are humans. Uh, Joanna, I think you are, you, you see here, uh, there's already, you're already registered with the primary email, so you shouldn't have problems. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know exactly. But you, you have, pro do you have problems? Why? It doesn't run. I'm make a, a, a breakout room with her. It does, yeah, it does but... not appear in my... Uh, wait a sec. Um, I will add you, uh, Alison. Uh, I will add you as a. As a manager. Because I don't, I don't think otherwise you can uh, add her to the. My my um, it does not appear in my Google Groups. It it does not appear. I don't know why. 
It might be. Mm, I think I wanted to write you before, and it Joanna? it was. Um, yes, sorry to. So to you write. are ignoring. Yes, I see. I don't know. I will. I will. Uh... Uh, I mean, just try to uh, double check if that you are connected. One uh, minute go. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like. Let me end. It, it works now. Thank you. Uh, I gave it another refresh and it appears yeah. now. Refresh, uh, refresh your, uh, I mean, all of you that if you were not able to run things, just try to see whether uh, having, having refreshed changes anything. Diana, especially, I think you were, you were mentioning that before, right? That it wasn't yeah, working. now it's working. Thank you. Okay, great. It's amazing when things work. Indeed. Okay. So uh, what I was saying, so um, Alison before said that you are charged by the number of columns you are uh, requesting. And the, the cool thing here is that if you um, restrict to a number of columns, Then, and you check this number here. So this before was uh, over 500 gigabytes. And then now it computes and it's just 67 gigabytes. So you have real time in this, in this interface, you have real time uh, forecast on how much data, data you're gonna shuffle and roughly how much the query should be charged on, on, your, on your pocket. And if it doesn't, if, if the query it's uh, syntactically incorrect, it will it will tell you that's uh, that's something bad. Okay. Uh, so if you run this other query here, second one, you will see that now the number of column is just the one that you requested here. Okay. Now. Let's go to something that we have seen before as well. Right. So try this query here. So this one is about again. We need to count. Um, we need to count by um, by publications by year, right? And if you write down this query and you run it, you will start seeing things that. Uh, that something that looks off and uh, this is uh, uh, is, is the first uh, treasure hunt that we are going through. So you start seeing ears that that look uh, unrealistic, I would say. and uh, and this is why and, and uh, if you if you if you, for example, get, restricted this record here and so in this way it will get only one record back and uh, or alternatively so what what I am interested in you to to try is that basically if you go on this record here I will I will copy past it in the chart let's close a bit of windows uh, chat. Ah, you want the query in the chat. Uh, we were thinking actually that if you if you focus on typing, that would be better because it makes you uh, it makes you more. Um, I mean, it, it makes you more focused and uh, it, uh, and and lets you concentrate on 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 the task. I don't know if you if I'm going too fast, then I can slow down. Okay. You have access to all the queries later. You, yeah, you yeah. can be copying, but try at least for the first few, try to type it and you'll be forced to learn. This is the data set. This is the table name. This is the field name. Uh, Nuria? Yeah, just to say that uh, you, you move too fast. I'm not. 
Oh, okay. I Sorry. do not have any time to to. I, I don't have any time no, enough yeah. to to type it. Type. Uh, if it's uh, okay. So having it at the chat would be useful, even if it is an, an image I, and I, we I have to stay, type it. I will but, stay. I will stay on this. Uh, yes, you must. Let's do like and this. Enlarge a little bit, maybe oh. Control Plus, Control Shift Plus. I don't know to enlarge the the key. Yes, yes, that's it. Thank you. No, just uh, what I. So what I with I mean with this query, what I wanted to you to be aware is that so there is this off looking here, right? And it boils down to this publication, this identifier. If you uh, go on explore.opener.eu and you search for something, then you will end up with the with the with this kind of URL. And if you copy paste that um, ID in here you will see you will end up on on a on a document which indeed has the questionable uh date in there and if you go on the CERN document server you will see that the data is there so we don't do any kind of magic here so if garbage is is uh, aggregated we cannot be better than than the garbage we we consume we just produce the same uh the same problem we just reproduce the same problems right so <clears throat> uh now we because we have these spurious uh data we need to do two things so we need to first of all f uh, isolate the year from the date and this can be done by this uh this uh, function here that extracts from this date 2024 and and uh, and then we can plug it into the query I, I will i will just bear with me and uh, we will write down the final query so that uh, you don't need to run all the queries of the story and then so um here with this function plugged into the query now the column here is indeed has been extracted with the uh, with the four first four digits, and then you want to constrain. So this is the final one, the one that, that provides you the answer to the, the initial task. If you want to try it again, you need publications. You want to use publication date. Which is the column that has the the contains among the other things the year as well, and and from there you extract the year from date publication date, and that you call it year, and then you count. Here you could count IDs, for example, rather than star. You call that name and pubs. Then you group by year because you want to have distinct years. And you restrict the years between 2000. Uh, to, here you have a, a having close rather than aware because the filtering happens at the level of the group. So you want the groups of years that are before 2004. Uh, 14 and after 2024 to be uh, ruled out. Here I commented something. I said that uh, 
that these two statements here are equivalent, but uh, I was reading yesterday um, that between is, is, is optimized because it runs the check once rather than twice. So it might be uh, it might be more suitable to you to be used rather than having these two statements. And then at the final at, at the end, you order by year descending order. So you get more recent history on the top of the table and ancient history at the bottom of the table. And there we go. So you see 20, 2024, Noria. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for me, it, it do not recognize the years. The 2014, 2022, it, it looks like uh, the unrecognized name. Are you sure that is, is I mean. Oh, is... no, sorry. I haven't, yeah, sorry. The first order was not correct, sorry. Okay. It's, it was probably the wrong field you you were taking, right? Uh, Joanna, yes. sorry, Joanna and all the others, uh, are you running queries? Is it working now? Mm, uh, what is the editor exactly? I entered into queries and I entered into notebooks. Okay, so I don't uh, do it in notebooks. Go into notebooks. Just go into query. So is this queries? One? I get the same message if I if I I say I say I select uh, create tables. Yeah. And uh, I, I receive the I will uh, copy paste the message in in the chat. I still have. Um, Alison. Uh, Oh, what? Um, okay, okay. Uh, you want me to go to a breakout room with her? Yeah, Something like if, that. If, Joanna, if, if there is someone like Joanna that doesn't is not able to run queries, uh, just you can you can try Alison to sort out what is the issue, and then uh, if you can solve it, then just do it there. Otherwise, uh, tell me. Create a break. I think I don't have the uh, let me okay. check the permission so, to create breakout rooms. Mm. Breakout rooms, create, let's create two breakout rooms and sign automatically so manually let, uh, let participant choose room. Open all rooms. Okay, so now me and Joanna and Sylvia, Diana, we both. Anyone that has been running, so it, it is my understanding that someone can run and someone else cannot. I'm running okay, right. I, okay. Okay. I, I will join breakout room two and whoever has problems running, join me in breakout room two, please. Okay. I see people moving. Okay. Great. So let's continue. It works. <laughs> let's continue with the... Um, with the normal flow. Uh, so now the next, let me resize a bit the window. The next uh, subtask, which still works uh, with years, it combines basically the two queries that we see at the beginning, right? So don't, do not close. I mean, you can open as many queries, tab, as, many queries tabs as you want. It, it will become clumsy. You can say, I think, Perhaps you can you have rights to save them, but I mean you can keep indeed uh, creating new query tabs uh, and and generating them uh, and um, writing them uh, as much as you want. So what I want to do, what I want you to do now is to basically uh, no, uh, Nuria. Yeah, sorry, sorry. How can I name them? What the, query? the queries? Uh, it looks like they can have a name, so I can... So if you go on, let me see. If you go on save, save query. Yes. Ah, then, then is when I can name them. Yes. Okay. Then it also prompts you region. Just leave the one that's selected. Okay. Because Google Cloud is complicated. So. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. It's safe. I, I hope it saved uh, the resource. 
so in this subtask, what I want to do is to shuffle, is to combine the, the first two queries. So the one that was looking for a substring and the one that was aggregating by year. And if, if you see like the only difference is this statement here, is the where statement. So if you go back to the query and after the from, you add that, it would read exactly the same as before, but before aggregating by year, it will filter rows. It will filter rows by checking main title containing COVID or not. And you see, like if you see a nice, sad for us, bump around 2020, 2021, 2023, and then going a big, uh, it, it lost apparently a bit of hype uh, in 2024. Okay, uh, and also that that's also because 2024 is a is partial year because the dump was the so the snapshot of the open air graph was uh, from July, which means almost half of the year is not accounted for. So if, if the thing was linear, that would be like 74, 75,000, uh, which is still less than 2023 volume, but it's indicative that perhaps there's a bit of a, there was a, a indeed a, a bubble of COVID uh, material. Then another, uh, another query that we might want to run is the one about language code. So language code is a shortcut for uh, what, has, what, what is originally contact in the structure field language as documented on the manual, on the, on the um, documentation. So if you see here, language is a, is a JSON uh, field, which has two sub properties, one is called and one is level. And uh, when I created the tables, uh, Okay, I'm just checking if there were any problems. Uh, when I check, uh, when I when I transformed the, the the JSON table into the final format, I extracted to make things a bit easier. Uh, so I created column as a as all, uh, always. I mean, any time possible, I created a column. So language code, you have it. Uh, you have it there, and if you copy paste. Again, you, you select from publication, uh, you group by language code, you order by, um, you are interested in the fields language code, and uh, let's do for count ID, let's do things. Uh, if you do count star, I think it, it will, you see how the, the dimension uh, increases or not. So uh, if you if you so now you're you you, you want to aggregate uh, you want to group by on on language code counting by uh, counting number of papers and papers order by n papers the sending order and limit to the first twenty five. I saw. Um, Okay, so let's see here what we have. And so and is undefined. And then permission, uh, Naima? Yes, I have the same problem. I, I have no access to notebook. But in, in not the notebook, uh, the query. Uh, the notebook don't, I mean. Okay. Just, just limit to query panel. Not the notebook. Do not open notebooks. Okay. 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 Thank you. Just always try to be on the same on the same uh, on the same interface. I'm I'm sh um, I'm showing to you. Uh, the, the notebooks can be problematic. Yeah, and uh, I noticed that as uh, there might be problems in allocating computational uh, runtime. So. Uh, 
the, yeah, yesterday I was trying to, with Alison and another colleague, to open a couple of notebooks at the same time. And uh, for some reasons, the, the CPU quota was, uh, was uh, running out. So while if we run queries by the query interface, so magnifying glass here, the, that that's gonna be that's gonna work, okay. But uh, just please uh, let me know, Naima, if you can run queries from the query interface, from notebooks. That that I expect it wasn't it, it wouldn't work. Yes, it, it's okay for the okay, great. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so I was saying here this field. Is uh is one of the one of these fields that we're trying to um that that that's uh it's partially cleaned. So there are some uh language codes that are uh that look non-standard. So espanol uh, espanol uh it looks uh, there's a spa for Spanish and then it it, it comes up again. So it indicates that we need to uh, enforce a better uh, cleaning procedure here. But what I want to uh, showcase, and, and um, I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, focus on this query, which is uh, simple, simple, uh, is that we do not uh, focus on, on English content material only. So our, our uh, inclusivity value uh it's it's towards any kind of language so we don't have any restriction and the good i mean we think that that's uh a plus side because you can potentially do uh, regional research if you're if you're interested in in uh, for example uh uh global south uh research trends and so on you could uh, in principle, limit uh, your uh, your uh, publication search into certain certain languages or certain uh, data sources to just restrict to that particular region, and you will find results. So it it, it won't you it won't rule you uh, out from or prevent you from doing your research just because it's not uh, it, it it focuses on content. Uh, that's in uh, in Portuguese, for example. I've seen lots of people that work with uh, Alison, for example, when they want to work on Portuguese and Brazilian institutions and whatsoever, they go to Cielo, and uh, because that that's the the best candidate to start to begin with. But you know, like if uh, the direction would be to have everything ingested inside inside open air, so that that would be the the first plot the first point to look at uh whenever uh, someone wants to um to address a research question next task for us uh count publication by country so i will copy these and explain that in the proper panel so again uh this time it gets a bit more complicated and it involves the last uh sql construct that that uh, Alison was sh was uh, showing before the break, which is unnest, and this is because if you go on here, uh, you see country. So country is a field of research product, and it is structured in this way. It's an array, because cardinality is many. It's an array of result country, and a result country is an object which is structured this way. So we are the piece of information that we are interested in is the code. So what do I do here? Again, this query involves, involves only publications. Country is the target, uh, is my target column that has that bit of information that I want. So I unnest it because it's, a, it's, a, it's an array. So I want to explode that array in many rows, in as many rows as the, as the array size is. And for and I call it as with a nickname with an alias, which is called pub country. And then so for on, on the select statement here, I do uh, a, a JSON path operation. So I want the JSON value of of the variable of the column uh, pub country at the address code. 
and I name it as code or country code. I mean, we can, why not? Let's be more explicit. Country code count distinct ID as n pubs. Now here, you see, I, because I changed these uh, alias, here I get group by code and it, it shows me a flags an error. And that's because I renamed that. And the parser gets hungry. So when I get this way and I rerun, the first column will be called uh, not code, but country code. And then because I'm ordering and limiting to the first 10 results, I get this ranking here. And again, as we were doing that before, we could plug uh, where close, where, uh, sorry, where uh, contains subst main title. And then the literal, let's say, let's do again COVID. Not that I'm obsessed, but I, it's something that I'm, I, I'm sure I will find. And these, the count dropped, presumably as expected, because now we are restricting to something narrower. And, and yet we do the rest of the operation is exactly the same. You aggregate by country, count the publication that instead now are filtered by COVID. Do I have you here? Yes. Uh, Alison, uh, Alison, I, uh, you are, so Alison, uh, let me see the phone. They cannot see shared notebooks. Alison. Okay. I don't know what Alison is, uh, how, how it's going for him in the other room. Um, okay. So this one, uh, is it's another variation uh, of the one that we were we were doing before. Sorry, can you go back? Uh, because it wasn't working for me. Wh which one? Uh, the um, uh, the number of publications with COVID um, group by country code. Yeah, this one. Uh, yes, please. Okay. Sorry. What's the problem? I don't know. I have an unrecognized na name, uh, number okay. of papers. Ah, okay, because I had number of papers and it was number of publications. Sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah. Let me know if it if it runs. Yeah. Now it runs. Sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm interrupting too much. Sorry. It's a training exactly for this reason. Like it's it would be on, on in person. I think it would be much better. Uh, like having it remote uh, makes it uh, more clunky. But no, it's very useful. I just I need some time to type. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. It's uh, it, it, I mean, I could have given you the the queries uh, beforehand, but. When I was talking with Alison, it was like, yeah, you know, like if you if you give the code, they would just copy paste and uh, and do not without thinking, you know, like um, about the little error that that might come up. Yeah, yeah, I I totally agree, but <laughs> I prefer I prefer that we see less complicated, articulated and uh, queries and perhaps few examples, but at least that you know, like. 
you have a sense of accomplishment. You're like I, I, I've done it. It's just not. I, I didn't just copy paste what I've been. I, I was provided. Thank you. So, uh, this one we were saying is the um, it, it, we are restricting to a specific year. So it, it should be easy by now. Like uh, we had the the where before with the keyword, just scrap that and and uh and add uh extract year from date publication date equals to whatever 2023 20, 20, and when you run that it will give you exactly the same table with the same shape with different numbers because now we are it's not anymore about covid it's it's about the whole body of science but restricted to uh 2023 2023. And of course, you can combine those. So you can combine things. Let me get this bit. So now that you extracted the year and and forced it forced it to be equal to 2023, you can add an end, and you can say that uh, contains uh, main title equal uh, and the substring. Uh, this time, uh, in the example, I put CRISPR, which is um, is uh, one particular redundant uh, DNA sequence. That's work for uh, finding like bookmarks and making funny, funny manipulation with Cas9. Uh, and uh, if you, but if you can put any any anything you want, COVID if you prefer. I I just didn't want to be uh, monothematic. And um, and in in if you run these now the, because you have two two where constraints, you get even lower results, of course. Everyone on the same page. Almost. Almost. Anyone with problems, runtime issues, off looking things? Can I add this time it worked, but can I ask something? Yeah. Uh, what's, what does it mean when we uh, move to the right, the ah, okay. sentence? This one, so indentation. Um, so it, it, it means nothing to SQL. It means it might mean something to you. Okay. Uh, so you could run the query this way, but for my eye, I mean, you see, like the parser is still fine with that. Okay. But, but it, it might be more confusing for your eye to parse the information. So here you have two queries, right? You have, you have two table. You have one table and one on nest. And if you if you want to see that by uh, the glance of the eye. And you, if you have it like that, or you could even do it, push it further, and have a, have a different for a, you can you can have a new line for every for every field that you want to select for. If you have many, then is it becomes really tiring to parse the information if you have everything on one line. So it might be more convenient sometimes to have things on multiple lines just for the sake of readability. And the, the, the same thing, uh, I, I mean, I'm telling you this just... Uh, so it, the system understands that it's yes. the same sentence that the previous? It doesn't care about 
new lines. It doesn't care about extra spaces. Okay. Not part of the syntax. It doesn't even care about uh, capital letters. If you write here from, uh, from, it, it's an error, but from uh, yeah. case, that's perfectly fine for him. Okay. Uh, the only reason why I I I write it I wrote it this way is it's because I mean it's part of the standard. It yeah. does, it's not a hard requirement for the parser, and the uh, reason why it's uppercase it's because it's more readable. Again, you visual you visually highlight, uh, you visually highlight which are the keywords reserve words of of SQL language from anything that you plug into your query. That's okay. that's only a visual thing. So but, the comma means that is the same sentence, whatever it is in the same line or not, and it only changes when there is no comma. No, 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 no. Wait. Oh. The comma, the comma is a different thing. Uh, okay. If, but if I so if I bring this up, yeah, you, you will see that I have a problem. Yes. So comma, it's an implicit way to say join. Let's say. And because there is an unnest, so here it, it creates a table on the fly. And because there's a comma here, it joins it to publications. So it's it, it, it basically this statement is uh, it's what Alison was explaining before that there is this column country is an array. And because you are interested in every element of that array, you, you need to access it. And the way you access each element of that array, it's by unnesting it. And when you unnest, you, you get, so you have you have this row and here you have the array and then you unnest and the array becomes n fold. And as many times as, as the size of the array. And, um, and, uh, and, 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 you need the comma before that because that's basically here you're listing the tables. When when you do from table one, comma, table two, comma, table three, you are listing the tables and you are saying that you are basically uh, joining them implicitly. And it's the same here. Like when you, I mean, it's the same. The comma here is not, um, it is not functional to go on a new line. It's functional on the to the fact that you have one column in the new in the table you are producing and another mm -hmm. column in the table you are producing you have two. okay so this doesn't it could there could be lots of blank new lines in the middle it would be perfectly equivalent doesn't care okay thank you and it's the same for capital letters um, don't, if you don't want to, don't be bothered about uh, making them. Uh, I, they get still highlighted in bluish rather than black. Uh, okay. So now active projects. So here I defined an active project as a project that it's still ongoing. And uh, so this time, rather than working on publications, we move to another table, which is called project. And again, if I, I resize a bit here, if I want to know what's inside project, I can go uh, here on the left, OIG 24-7 projects, and I get the list of all the tables, of, of all the columns. And then there they are, start date, end date. These, these two are the two strings. The type is string. They can be null. But these two are the, the, the two columns that I want to look at. And if you if I go on preview, I will see that start date and date, they might be some 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 sometimes they are initialized and they have null as in the end date. Sometimes they have null in both. And uh, yeah, I mean, we have lots of projects. I cannot see them all from here. And then that's why I write a query. And then again, here I'm, so I'm, I'm interested in project and I put that in the from close. And then from select, let's say that I'm, I want to, I could go for star as usual, but let's say that I'm planning wisely what I want to see. And I just add ID, which is the project ID, the title, 
And then I use the same function uh, to that we used for the for the publication date, but this time it goes for uh, for the start date and end date. Here, this one is a bit redundant. It doesn't is not needed in, in really projects dot. It's implicit. But you can see like whether I put it or not. Whether I add the, this uh, is called is a is a specifier is a is a table specifier. Whether I put it or not doesn't change much because there's only one table and there's only one column that's called start date and date. And uh, so it it doesn't complain because there's uh, there's no ambiguity in what I'm writing. If there was ambiguity, if I was for example joining two tables with the same uh, the same column names then it would, that would be ambiguous and the parser would fire me back with an error uh, saying, uh, um, guy, make up your mind on which table this field is from because otherwise I, I, I don't have a clue on how to run this query. And uh, so if you run that this query here, uh, you get this, uh, this, this column. Now, this query doesn't reply yet to the to the question so we want to see which are the uh active project wait a second uh i uh, know yeah yeah so I, I i was thinking about so i was thinking about a different problem so this this one uh exactly replies to the to the question i, I was making before i thought we had to do an aggregation at some point but no it's not um... so as you can see here all the end dates are from the next year or onward. There are even long-standing uh, long grants like this one, 96 and still ongoing. And this is probably a US uh, project that gets renewed on a yearly basis. Uh, so it, it might, if you're accustomed to short running e e e EC projects uh, for the European Union, uh, these very long, uh, time spans can be strange at first at least at least they were for me but then when i started looking into details of what these projects are and where they come from uh it, it totally makes sense made, made sense to me uh why they are okay so subtask so now we are we are still doing this thing about uh counting projects but we want to check uh, the jurisdiction and the jurisdiction is basically where the, the, the what is the funding agency or from or what is the area geographic area where the grant pertains to and so let's copy these in this other window so and and uh, it's pretty much the same but again, you need uh, you need um, an extra field. And how do I know that? Again, I go back to the to the documentation here, and this time, so I had uh, research products, but I'm interested in projects. And then if I go to funding, I see there's a, a field which is called jurisdiction. Okay, so that's. This, this is the field I'm the the field I need to work on and uh, because it's uh, an, again an array because cardinality is many so it's an array of structures of JSON field of, of JSON uh, objects when I go here I need to unnest okay and so I, again projects unnest funding as P fund this is going to be our nickname where this is exactly the same clause as before. And then now I add and because it's a it's joining joining, I'm joining conditions and JSON value P fund, the field jurisdiction equals to EU. And uh, and then I'm I'm adding jurisdiction on top of uh, the select. Just to see what, just to see whether the, uh, yeah, sorry, I, if you select, if you have something selected and you click run, it will run just whatever you have selected, and you see, it goes like 
unexpected identifier because it starts parsing from where the selection starts starts. This is handy if you have lots of queries in, in the same in the same window in the same it's like um, a notepad uh, page but and you if you, you want to run just one. I don't use it that much because if you don't if you don't select then it runs all of them which uh, is not might be something that you don't want to. But if you run these without having selected anything, then you see that it's picking up on jurisdiction uh, fairly enough, and still they are uh, active projects, okay? So here we, we wanted to count though, active projects by the jurisdiction. So this was just, um, I was cherry picking Europe just to see whether things, whether the query was uh, was properly set up, but the real query that that uh, that uh, answers the 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 question is this one. So projects are nest funding P fund. Now you 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 don't need the close the close we had before. Let me. Sorry. Let me comment these. So this close year that where I was uh, chaining the condition for the jurisdiction to be equal to EU is not uh, is not needed anymore. So I dropped it, and it's only the one about the year. And then now I'm grouping by jurisdiction because that's the unique value that I want to get. I want to get unique jurisdictions and I count on N projects descending order. And now I am interested in, in the select, I'm interested in the jurisdiction and count in project. And so I get two columns sorted, US uh, standing out as the first country with active projects, then Great Britain, EU. And then, I mean, this might be counterintuitive, then you see Portugal and Netherlands and Austria, Switzerland, which are within EU, but these are national funding agency. So the projects that are counted here do have a different jurisdiction because they are nationally funded. While this one, row number three, is the one that the European Commission funds. So that's why they do not add up to the same total. So yeah, it's a factor that you might want to account for or not, depending on on the analysis that you need to do. Everyone with me? Andrea, for yes. the... For the result without uh, jurisdiction label, but with some counts of projects, um, yeah. do you know why? And row nine in the results? Uh, it, it's it's probably empty. Okay, so we have uh, 1,025 projects uh, that has no... Uh, Stefania, Stefania oh. what? Miriam? It could be because we cannot add the jurisdiction for all the projects that we get. I Go. Be because we cannot add the jurisdiction for all the projects that we get from a funder because sometimes the funder does not fund only uh, projects for the same country. So adding the jurisdiction. Mm. You, so I don't know if you if you hear if you heard. Yes, yes, it, it was. Uh, I I could hear. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So working, and uh, I mean, the more I work with the data, the more I find this kind of uh, pitfalls. Let's say, like it's either you know the explanation. Uh, behind that, which I mean, sometimes it could be the matter of uh, checking the, doc the the documentation, but sometimes it, it, like you see things and uh, and uh, you, you really don't know where where the problem stems from. It could be a problem 
uh, right from the source. It could be a problem uh, more, you know, uh, on on the open air side. So problem. I mean, there could be a justification on the source that was wrong from the beginning, as as we have seen for the dates, or there could be a justification for that um, that that issue that you have seen because it's it's part of the internals of uh, on 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 how open air works. So I'm a bit concerned about the guys that are in the other room. Um, I, I came back. I came back. We're back. We're back. You are back. Okay, yes. great. Everything everything solved. It, it works. Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I thought at some point, Alison, that you move everyone everyone to in CISPO and you were showcasing your things because you know that uh, because you you have um, admin powers uh, there, and I thought, okay, I mean that, that's still fine. Yeah. Oh, we stayed something like okay. five minutes. So. Okay, okay, okay. Great. Um, let me check the time. Uh, let's do something more here. Yes. Uh, okay, let's uh, let's go. Okay, le I, I would like to go to this one. So in, in open air as in other uh, other data sources, we have uh, open access statuses. So it, it could be interesting, for example, to measure uh, the uptake of open access and uh, and and different uh, and and the different ways research can be disseminated so uh, in this way we go back to publication <clears throat> disable is publication and again here we want to do as usual we go back to publication and there's best access right so best access right is gonna be popular is a field is a, is a field that's going to be uh, populated with the most open access right that's associated to the research product why the most open access so research products as i was explaining in the beginning uh, they are they duplicated and each instance that is caught by the the duplication mechanism is called manifestation or instance so here is called you can see this field instance, which is exactly what I'm I'm telling about. It's it's uh, collect it collects all the places where that uh, particular so to be article or research product has been seen by and 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 the duplication the duplication algorithm thinks all these instances are the same. So. <clears throat> Best access right, as I was saying. So uh, you go to publications and you, because you wanna do, you wanna drill down by year. So you wanna group by year and then you wanna group by best access right. So you have two levels of group by. Uh, so here, this time we have year, comma, JSON value, best access right, dollar label. So you're grouping first by year, first and, and, and second by the best access right label. And then it, you pretty much do the same as we were doing before. So uh, extract the year in the usual way, JSON value, best access right. This is exactly the same statement as we were using that here below. You we nickname as a open access status, and then you are counting papers. This is the aggregation. So. That, that we want to perform. Uh, again, this is just for uh, a matter of uh, presentation. I just limited to the last uh, 14 years not to have too many rows and uh, order by year descending. So most recent up uh, up first in the, in the table. And then for each year, you start seeing things. Now it means that uh, for that, mm, so for these, um, 1,140,000 uh, and a few more uh, records, uh, you don't have uh, a, an, an open access status, a best open access status um, set. So it's unknown. Uh, and then for every year you see like the, the, the second level of uh, aggregation for all the voices.
Now, because we were speaking about the instances, this leads very nicely to uh, to this. So, mm, mm, this one, this query here doesn't do anything except for doesn't count. Doesn't uh, well, no, yeah, that, it does count. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I thought I thought I had another one before. Um, what I can show you? No, let, let's let's do like that. Okay, so uh, publications. So is the we are working on the publication table and we are unnesting instance. Instance. Let's let's do the the usual way. Instance, as I was saying before, is an array. It's many. You see the brackets here. A flag for the presence of an array and each element here. It's like that. So this is an instance, and uh, there could be for a research project there could be more than one instances that have been spotted around. And uh, instance has uh, where is that? As a type. So uh, each research product in the table uh, publication, so each publication within publications table has any time that has instances, every instance will have an article, uh, will have a type, which can be of different kinds. And this query tries to discover what is the variability of that field. So um, by a nesting instance and 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 cherry picking the the JSON value uh, with JSON value the type as instance type, existent type, uh, I can count how many uh, instances there are because now after unnesting, I'm 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 inflating the table. So it's not any it's not anymore the number of rows of publications is the number of rows of publications and all the instances opened up, exploded. All the arrays now they they are exploded as popcorns. And the table is much bigger than before. So then I group by instance type, instance type, and I count. Here I'm using a reserved uh, uh, a reserved uh, keyword, which wouldn't be the best to do. But I mean, it doesn't complain about that, but I don't like it much. And uh, and then you you see that that instance type field can be uh, initialized with lots of let me drag a bit here so there can be articles journals journal journal papers other kind of literature type books chapter of books uh, conference objects then something more obscure like research which you don't know really what's inside. Uh, generic preprint patents and so on and so forth. Okay, audiovisual film. Uh, these are uh, might be because of um, some internals showing up as uh, because of some internals, but like bear with me. Uh, and uh, what you might want to be interested in is to uh, filter by a set of types of instances. So this query uses uh, a, um, a construct, which is called, which we have seen in Alison part, but we haven't used so far, which is in. So um, again, by keeping everything that we were seeing before, before uh, the, the, in, um, uh, without variations, this query here fetches all the IDs and only the IDs of the inst of the um, the publications, so the rows in publications that do have an instance which type in this list. So in this time, in in this way, you you, you basically are fetching the uh, IDs of anything that has an instance of either article type, book, conference object, uh, part of book, of chapter of book, data paper, software paper, just that. 
and you can use it. You can use it in this way. So like basically you are saying uh, because the query gets IDs. So you can you can use it to force IDs to and to filter them in the main table. So you are saying just skim through the rows of publications and pick the rows, cherry pick the rows whose ID is inside the IDs that are provided by this other query here. So this one is a bit more articulated and uh, I hope I was clear enough, but maybe I wasn't. So <laughs> if you have, um, if you encounter problems in, uh, in me explaining that, just tell me so I can, I can try to make it uh, more, more clear. Uh, Andrea, we have something in the chat. Do you yeah. want to read Previous query, receive the following message, a recognized name count. Uh, wait a sec. Uh, let, let me copy that. I minute. said order by count in, instead of a real field name. Yeah, no, it, it should be in N instances because uh, count was uh, was a name used before. And uh, and I change it to any instances. So count here before this one was count, but then I changed it just for the sake of naming. Okay, yes, it is slightly it, it, dangerous using a function name as a variable name. I mean, sorry, it's interrupt this. The function. Yeah, no, all these functions. I mean, count is a function, so it doesn't. Yes. Clarify. Because in here, SQL knows that you are using this as a name, while count this count is a is a function, so it doesn't clash. But it's usually a best practice not to use reserved keywords for the language as names of variables, columns, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. aliases. It, it just worked for you, so um, yeah, no, that, exactly. that was why it, it was working because I I I renamed uh, an instance is here and here. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, so back to this one. So um, is it clear what I'm? Uh, what is the logic behind this query? Which is a you know like it's a bit more complex because there's a, there are two wins, two win, uh, so to set comparisons in a row. So first of all, I'm checking uh, the publication rows whose instance as type one of either one of these uh, set here. And then I'm getting publications whose ID is one of these ones. And then I'm limiting to 10 because otherwise it would get all the publications. It would get all the publications falling within, within this uh, filter. I'm I'm just getting the first the first ten because otherwise it's uh, it, it would get lots of um, results. And then similarly, uh, you can do something like okay. I think we need to move probably to the join section. Okay, let's do uh, perhaps the last one. So here, for example, if you're interested in peer review material, my material, uh, did I copy? I think I didn't copy, yeah. I didn't copy the one. So this one, uh, again, for, for, for uh, within instance, if we go here, instance, there's a refereed. And refereed can be it, it flags for the peer review process that the that instance has been gone through. So peer reviewed is the is the is the guy we want because it flags for peer peer review material. So in that in this case, <clears throat> it, it's a 
period that we have seen previously. So it gets uh, is the one about um, counting uh, publication counting publications by country, but this time we want to restrict to just peer review material, just that, not everything under publications, just peer review material. So it's exactly the same. There's a there's a where where ID of publications is in, and then here we are doing. Uh, the same business that we were doing in the previous query. So we select distinct the ID from publications. So we are selecting distinct rows from publications, a nested, a nesting instance. And then we are selecting those publications whose instance is refereed equal, uh, refereed is equal to peer reviewed. So we are just hitting those. Uh, and then if you run that, there's a limit by 10, which it, it limits to the first 10 countries. There you go. Uh, have I lost you? You all with me? This was, uh, I mean, let's skip this one. But so this was the example that uh, Alison showed in the in the um, slides where you aggregate by full name. Uh, yeah, I know. From uh, five, five, it ends at five. So we go to the joins and then we do the data oh, out and then we'll like finish on time. I promise you. Um, so this one, yeah. So here, the problem of this one is that basically, the basically full name is not uh, unique because there might be person named after the same name and certain name and surname, or it could be the, the same full name. So when you aggregate that, you get distortions. So the idea of this other query was to uh, to plug into the um, the query the ORCID ID. So at least. Uh, you could run a first aggregation on the ORCID and the, and then the full name and then aggregating on 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 uh, on number of publications. Okay, so let's close this one uh, and let's open the uh, advance, which I mean is just the, the the reason why we call it advance is just because we want to uh, show you the relationship. So, and, be, and and because there will be joins in the next examples. So this is the relationship. It's just the first 10 rows because I what I'm I was interested in is, is to show you the anatomy of the table. So you have sources. These are IDs of items in inside open air. In in it, it could be in any table. Which table is flagged by the this, uh, this other uh, source type. I mean, this one, it says generically that's a result. So it could be either within publications, software, data sets, or other. Then, sorry about that. Then you have target, which is pretty much, it functions exactly the same. So it's every row of the result of the relation table, it's like a wire. It wires two rows of different of different tables. And uh, it's a patch cable. And then the patch cable has a color. And the color flags for the semantics. So you have relation name and relation type. So relation type tells you what, what broader uh, family of relations that cable is about. So citation, citation, citational re relationships. And relation name tells you the precise semantic sites. So it's source, sites, target. It, it doesn't work the other, the other way around. If target and source were swapped, that would be is cited by. And you can see these uh, here. These are the semantics uh, of, of, of all the the possible flavors that patch cables here in the relation table can have. They can be uh, 
relation type similarity, versioning, relationship, generic relationship, relationship, path, provision, citation, and citation. There are many, many of those. Like citation is cited by, then you see citation at some point, cites. So citations are always directed. Uh, what, you might ask why you got so uh, complicated in here. These are the citations uh, provided by data site. Uh, so the data site um, on the, the, the relation class, the, the, the schema for the metadata model for relation uh, types. These are properties of, of the instances in the ontology. Sorry, come again. These are properties of the uh, uh, in the ontology of the graph. No, 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 no. These are these are you. These are not instances. These are just no, properties. Properties cited Pro by. It's properties of relations. Yes. Of relations. So is the if you if you. So you have an article that cites another article. These are two rows inside publication. And then there will be a row within relation that tells you source article A, target article B, and then the semantic is sites. Okay, so that that's the row in in the relation. It's it's a convenient. I mean, it was a convenient way to have just one table that links everything, possibly every everything every row. In in the other in the other it's it's a shortcut rather than having many tables that you need to know how to use and how to join. You just have uh, these uh, binary relationships like where you have source, target, and the semantic, and uh, and this is how I mean, for the time being and for the to be honest like for the oh. past years, yeah, yeah, the relations have been cited in uh, have been modeled in uh, within OpenAir. So if you want to do a simple the simple task about uh, for for, for uh, centrometrics inquiry of counting citations, uh, so this time you need uh, you need three tables, right? You, you, so you need publications the first time to get the cited the cited publications. Then you need publication another time to uh as as citing elements and then you need relations the bridge to bridge these two tables and then you're saying citing i so you're looking after semantics right so the the the, the wires that you are into the relations the the patch cables that you're interested into have semantic sites so because the source cites the target so you filter by relation name sites and then citing id so the citing papers the id of the citing papers are equals the relation source feed the column and the ids of the cited paper equal the target of the relation uh, table and then you group by cited because that's you, you want to know how many times something is cited and and uh, and uh, you count for citations and you order by citations. And you get these IDs, but of course I could have uh, I could have put here cited dot uh, main title as title just to get a bit more. Uh, a bit more informative output. I made the. Uh... Ah, uh, yeah. takes a bit more time because there are many tables and many rows uh, involved. I don't know here. 
Okay, it doesn't say anymore the size because it's running. It's about to finish. Yeah. And there you have it. So, I mean, running these kind of queries that involve uh, joining, so uh, publication as we speak, it's how big is that? Uh, details. So it's 545 gigabytes. So it's this one plus relations, which is 678 gigabytes plus another time uh, publications. So all joined and, and it does this in under 30, sec 30 seconds. 40 seconds and it's uh, I mean it's the best you can get it's uh, like there there's, there are no competitors perhaps Alibaba but I haven't tried it and uh, so yeah is this greedy okay does it make sense I it gets I mean the join as uh, as uh, Alison was explaining makes things more complicated to track, but is essential at some point because otherwise you're just, you know, like you're relinquished to uh, just one one table and the things, the operations that you can do with just one table are limited. While when you start joining, the complexity explodes and but the opportunities explode as well. Uh, of course, you can do the same by switching uh the second the, the the cited rather than having with the publications it could be data sets and uh, and now you're just counting uh the citations that are accrued by data set uh cited by publications simple as that everything else is is pretty much uh unchanged Let's do, let me, let me see what, um, let's do this one. So uh, here we want to count project by country or, and, uh, and the country is uh, proxied by the country of the organization. So uh, we want to, uh, the same project that's multi, uh, which has a partnership behind with the multiple nationalities, uh, it will be counted more than once because we want to know how many times that, I mean, we want to know how many project uh, country holds. So it doesn't matter if that if that project is shared uh, across different countries. We could we could do fractional counting, but doesn't it doesn't make um, much of a sense here at, the, at this stage. So, and I, I think in, it complicates things uh, in an unnecessary way. But so basically, so we, here we need to get uh, organizations as orgs and projects as proj and relations, because again, we need to bridge things. And here we are saying that the uh, ID in, uh, in the source is equals the organization's ID and the ID in the target equates the project ID. So I'm forcing uh, the, the relation table, which is in the bindle, to have IDs left and right, to, have, to match the IDs left and right, uh, source and target. And then I'm just uh, selecting the country code as country, and I'm counting over project identifier as end project and uh, grouping by country and order ordering by uh, project. This uh, null, it's because there might be uh, organization without a country specified. And then you see the, the results. Okay. Let me know if, if this query runs for you. If you don't, uh, if it doesn't run, just let me know. And then I think, I mean, let's, uh, I mean, all the join query, as complex as they can be, they all share the same principle because then, you, I mean, by having this fixed scheme for, for relation, 
it's it always looks like joining things with the relation in the middle and uh, and then forcing source and target to be to be equal to certain IDs and forcing optionally and a semantic to be um, to be of a certain kind, for example, uh, sites or is cited by or participates to a project. Um, something is supplement uh, so supplementary material of, of something else. It's always these binary relationships. And uh, that, I mean, that would be all, and and uh, that would be all I, for, for this uh, more um, for this part about uh, joins. the The only thing I want to uh, to t uh, talk about is uh, is about uh, uh, data takeout and uh, and advanced Python programming. And uh, I'm not expecting you to run code here. Just, uh, just bear with me uh, with wh whatever I'm, I'm I'm showing to you. So um, let let's uh, let's get this query here, and uh, I will explain you what. So um, so far we have seen uh, things happening within Google Cloud, right? So the the query the runs on on the on the cloud and results are showed in this table and you can see them you can scroll them the the result is paged but it looks like there is no way you can chart them for for, for that matter and uh, i never tried that you can see the json representation i i hope it doesn't explode because it, uh, yeah you can see the json representation of the of the thing Please go back to results. It's stuck. Um, but uh, so all these operations look like they are confined on Google, but which is not necessarily true. So you have set results and you are given several options. So you can uh, download as CSV, meaning on, on your Google Drive, and it's up to one gigabyte. So that that's not great because uh, Google Drive. I mean, I I have it eighty percent of my storage because of uh, the smartphone photo backup, but so you might have limited um, amount there unless you open a new account and uh, you start using as Alison was saying, uh, doing everything from from a scratch account. Uh, but in in that case, you have up to one gigabyte. If you the other option is to download as a local file. So if you, in that case though, the cap is limited to 10 uh, megabytes. You can the, you can copy to clipboard, which is even less. And, uh, and you can move it to Google Sheets. And I, th I mean, this one for, if you are accustomed to, um, to working with spreadsheets, uh, it could be useful, and it's useful if you if you have just a handful of of. Uh, I mean, if you know that the data is reasonably small, then you can pass it to a spreadsheet, and 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 if that's better for you, then you can you could do basically some selection of things, and uh, and then you just move to another tool that that's more that you are more comfortable with, but. Uh, there is another option to to do things, and in, 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 at this time it won't work because it's uh, you don't have access to runtime, and uh, you cannot create you cannot run notebooks. Uh, but basically, it's it works like uh, from from within the notebook, um, you uh, you run a query and you add on top this BigQuery magic, and uh, what the magic does, it saves as uh, the variable edges, the result. So the table that's that's been created by this query here, it gets create it gets created and and uh, and it's saved into that variable. So now it's uh, it's working because it, it it needs to create the runtime, but once once the the table it would look, I mean, it's processed. It would look that way. And what this query does is basically uh, it, it looks uh, it, it looks for uh, countries that co-participate in the same project, and creates a table where 
you have uh, uh, you have one country, another country, and how many times they collaborated in projects, whatever project they are. And you can see that there are lots of uh, self collaboration. So U.S. collaborating with other uh, institutions of the U.S., but then things can shuffle around. And uh, and and uh, if you, for example, filter, um, and I mean, you can pass it to to pandas. And to to Python as a, using that variable, and here I'm, uh, I used a, a library which is called iGraph. And the good thing with uh, with Python notebooks is that you can install with pip uh, missing packages. So in this case, iGraph is not provided by the standard configuration of the of the runtime, and uh, you can load it. And then, of course, I mean here I was. Uh, it's it's a complex because you need to know. What you're doing and what uh, and and uh, and how the library and uh, how the library works, but basically here I'm loading the variable edges uh, here, left country, right country, and count, and, and I construct a network uh, on top of that, and then I can plot the network. And these are um, if we move to Italy, for example, these are the countries. Uh, that collaborate with Italy, and it looks like a mess because there might be lots of, of lots of collaboration that make node collapse close to each other. But then, if you if you restrict to a country like Maldives, uh, Maldives, I, I, I don't know what's the current pronunciation, the correct one. Uh, you, you you start seeing uh, nicer networks being being plotted, and this can work in principle with uh, with anything. Uh, because it's wh whenever you save to pandas, so whenever you save as a data frame, uh, a, the result of a, of a Google uh, or BigQuery um, query, the data frame is it's um, it's still in the cloud and and can be bigger, much bigger than the one you could load in memory. So you you this um, unlocks. Uh, computational resources that, that you wouldn't be possibly dream of on your local machines, though, even though and and it's still if you're comfortable with if you're comfortable with pandas uh, working on your local machine, uh, you you would do exactly the same on a gigantic data frame that that would you, that couldn't be housed possibly in your in your laptop. So this was uh, everything for today.